This project was made possible in part through a grant from the Mountain Equipment Co-op Environmental Fund and the Alpine Club of Canada Endowment Fund. walking down a, a city street in the middle of downtown Vancouver. It's hard to believe that 110, 120 years earlier that it was an old growth Douglas fir cedar forest. Wild animals roamed all over the place. Mankind has lived out under the stars for 95% of his time on Earth or more. We've been striving all that time to take every bit of discomfort and unpredictability out of our lives, only to realize today that the worst thing that can happen to people is to have absolute comfort and absolute predictability. People are at their best when they're struggling. Well, mountaineering reconnects us with the types of natural challenges that really people had to deal with pretty well every day of their lives. So you want to go hiking or what? Climbing magazine. I'd have to say that the worst way to prepare for six months in the city is to spend six months in the mountains. My name is John Clark and I've been hiking around in the coast range on the west coast of British Columbia for about 28 years now. And usually I'm out in the mountains for about six months of the year, starting in May when we do usually a long ski traverse and then follow that with long foot traverses through the glacier country along the coast of the mainland of BC. One thing you need for long remote trips, of course, is huge amounts of time. If you plan a month-long trip, well, you need, to, you need to be off work for more than a month. You've got traveling time on either end of it, and you've got weather situations that'll dictate that you start late and wind up later. You need something like six weeks off to do a four-week trip in a lot of cases. What I've done over the years is have the six months of the year for climbing as a total given, and then build everything else around it so that that six months is sacred. The result of all this tramping around the coast range has put a few awkward gaps in my employment resume. I remember sitting in a restaurant listening to somebody in the, in the booth next to me, and he was in an awful state because he had a three-month gap in his, in his employment resume. He thought that was a terrible problem. I was kind of sitting there smiling to myself. I'd have to say over the years I've 
I've got no regrets about things, other things that I've left, except with women, I shake my head once in a while, but I always walked away from it. Sometimes it was very hard to do. There's a lot of women out there that I'm keeping very happy by not being married to them. Well, I take an enormous amount of photographs in the mountains, and I think I I do that because in the wintertime I just love showing off the coast range, giving slideshows at club meetings and to friends, and uh, just getting an appreciation for places that not very many people have seen. I like showing off the Coast Range and encouraging other people to go to these uh, magic places. There's those peaks. An exploration mountaineer's life is run by maps. Now that I think back, it's, it's amazing what a huge map collection I had so early because what's odd about it is that I had a vast map collection long before I had any idea what to do in the mountains. I had no idea. I didn't even know you could walk on a glacier. That's how incomplete my knowledge of mountaineering was, or anything outdoors. Well, this is my map collection, and uh, I've got hundreds of these things, covering probably 40,000 square miles of the mountains on the west coast of BC. So it's a situation that's a little bit out of control here, actually. And um, studying these things is probably the next most fun to actually being in the mountains. Whenever I can sneak away, I'll be looking at these maps and looking for routes that'll go through long, high alpine ridge systems. So I'm looking for continuous high systems of glaciers where traverse routes can be penciled in. And um, this is the stuff of dreams. Of course, this is where it all begins. I'll go through the, uh, the thing in detail, looking for potential spots that might give us trouble where there's constrictions of contours and these will be examined on aerial photographs and uh, I'd pretty well have to say that this is a part of the house I have to avoid if there's anything else to be done around the place. It's the preparation for it and the dreaming and the anticipation that's at least as much fun as the, as the trip itself. One of the all-consuming passions on a long trip has got to be food. I tend to have a kind of a Spartan food regime, fairly repetitive, but I have this theory that if you don't bring too many treats, then sooner or later, lentils and oatmeal becomes treats. This is a bag. On cold temperature trips, you need a lot of butter. Generally, we bring about 4,000 calories a day, and you can still lose weight. That's okay. It's not something you want to continue after you get back to the city and you're putting in serious couch time. Probably the least amount of fun you'll ever have is when you're rationing food. Not fun. problems with the industry is that it has the same appetite it had when there was an enormous supply. Now that supply is very small and it's creating an accelerating effect on the harvesting so that the last few strongholds of old growth are being liquidated at a terrific rate.
People evolved out of natural landscapes, so we have selfish reasons for keeping wilderness. We came from it, and we basically need it to survive. Well, on the mainland of BC, environmentally right now, we're in big trouble because the logging has pretty much eliminated all of the valley bottom forests in the whole distance from Vancouver to Prince Rupert. There's very, very few unlogged valleys. Well, all this walking around in the woods that I've been doing in the last 30 years, I've been able to observe some of the the problems that the logging industry has created, especially in salmon spawning streams. I remember in the upper Squamish River more than 30 years ago, this was when Wildwood was starting out in there, watching salmon physically try to burrow their way under logging debris. And there was maybe 200 yards of perfect spawning channel above that logging debris with not a fish in it. And uh, that really made an impression on me. One thing I'm observing out there right now with animals is that they're crowded into the remaining scraps of old growth, low elevation forests. Then you make an inquiry at the forest district office and discover that that remaining little piece is on somebody's five year plan. So there are definitely things that need to be changed out there. Cleaning up after the 20th century is gonna take a long time and it's gonna be done by individuals. Every time you plan one of these trips, you know you're gonna have an adventure out there, but you sure don't know what kind. I got dropped off by plane in Dean Channel at a, a river mouth called Jump Across Creek. I put my pack on shore and here these images just start appearing all over the rock. So it was like, for me, it was a great little discovery and uh, of course you wander around looking for more of them and then there's more and more and more and you spend half the day looking at these things and I got down on my hands and knees and looked at them really closely and uh, all kinds of things go through your head you wonder how old they are and it just makes you wonder you could just try to imagine the whole thing one hot summer day a couple of thousand years ago and it makes you want to know so badly it's almost maddening you just want to know what was it like when these guys were out there doing that? Well, the West Coast ranges are famous for bush. I mean, this was one thing the early climbers talked about all the time, that they never did look on the bush as some kind of a purgatory that they had to go through to get to the good part. It was very much a part of the climb. There sure is a lot of it out there, and there's a lot of it between you and the peaks. But I think, you know, a positive attitude is number one. It's like walking around in a big salad. And uh, a little bit of technique. You kind of, uh, it helps to roll with it. It thrashing around, flailing in all directions and screaming does not work. Because uh, the insects love it when you do that. It attracts them and they come over and sort of help out. If I was to describe the Coast Range in three words, I'd have to say they were, they're magical, they're isolated, and they're very wet. 
Oh, are we having fun yet? It's day eight. Man, you could just see something. There's a piece of ridge now. It's a good thing this is an enriching experience. Well, see you in 72 hours. After about 10 days, two weeks, something like that, something happens. And you get into that phase where you do get a sense of the landscape in a primeval kind of a way. It's almost as if you, you've unlearned everything that you knew about your city existence and you've sort of stepped into another reality. You're completely focused on the landscape and you're just floating in that landscape in kind of a dream state, I guess. And uh, you get really hooked on that. It takes a long time out there to, to kind of get a sense of what it might have been like for early man or for Aboriginal people to live out there under the stars the way we did. I think walking into a wild area is really good for your humility because here you're presented with a landscape and a, and a community of animals and plants that doesn't need us to manage it. That no matter what you try and do with it, you can't improve it. We have this notion that we need to manage wild places. Managing wilderness is something we have to kind of take another look at. Some of these peaks, it takes you a long time to get up. I remember getting to the top of one peak in the Silver Throne country and calculating that I'd spent 19 days tent bound alone on various attempts at trying to get up the thing over the years. Certainly if a, if a peak that you try turns you back, it kind of firms your resolve and makes you more determined to get up the thing. Yeah, it's nice to get up something that you've been trying for a long time, but the euphoria is pretty brief because a lot of times I'm looking out, spending most of the time on the summit, looking out, figuring out where the next project's going to go, looking at some distant peak off in the horizon. I just love building cairns, and I like finding them too, actually. It's nice to find a cairn that's 30, 40, 50 years old. It's got a story to tell, and it's kind of a little message from whoever came before. And um, they're basically a way to say hello to whoever comes afterwards. So we're saying greetings, basically, from the 20th century. So it may be a little while before somebody comes along and sees this. Generally, I put a message in there for the person to call me. And of course, phone numbers and addresses are no good. So I usually put my mountain equipment co-op membership number in the cairn. In, and of course, that won't matter where I'm living or where I've moved. Um, your co-op member is forever. It's for life. 
I mean, let's face it, you might have different addresses, you might even have different spouses, but your co-op number is forever. But I haven't got any calls from these things. So we need more traffic out there. I don't think motivation and drive have ever been a problem because frankly, I don't think I'm the one in control here. Not being the one in control means that you don't think about it. You don't think about whether you're going into the mountains. You just try and figure out where. You pack your bag and you go. It's really that simple. There's roads and there's roads And they call, can't you hear it? Roads of the earth and roads of the spirit The best roads of all are the ones that aren't certain One of those is where you'll find me Till they drop the big curtain Hear the wind moan in the bright diamond sky These mountains are waiting, brown, green and dry I'm too old for the term, but I'll use it anyway I'll be a child of the wind till the end of my day Sometimes it looks cursed Depends on what you look at Obviously But even more it depends On the way that you see Hear the wind moan In the bright diamond sky These mountains are waiting I'm too old for the term, but I'll use it anyway. I'll be a child of the wind till the end of my days. Hear the wind moan in the bright diamond sky. These mountains are waiting, brown, green, and dry. I'm too old for the term, but I'll use it anyway. Child of the wind till the end of my days. I don't think the thrill of standing on an unclimbed summit is ever going to wear off. It's something that uh, is just as exciting now as it ever was. Thank you.